April 28th, another Friday safety focus of the week. This week's code of conduct is to maintain cleanliness and condition of our vehicles and equipment. Any further discussion on this code item this week, Ben? Take care of it like it was your own. Because it kind of is. <laughs> yeah, if, if we if we've got to replace and repair and fix everything. Then there's less there's less money at the end of the year when we're thinking about giving increases, things like that. Um, but also it's our image and there's a lot of pride when we see one of our really good looking. I think Ken's got a picture of one of our new trucks all loaded up. And when that goes by, there's a, it, and it looks good. I think it, um, it, it it improves our image in the public when we have things that look neat and clean, look like a professional company. Right. So there's tons of benefits. <laughs> no downside, right? <laughs> There's probably no downside. No. Uh, so 313 days without a recordable injury. We are. I got to let them guys get to know. Oh, Daryl, you're muted. Uh, very impressive record. However, I wanted to highlight we had four first aid injuries in the last 25 days. So we are definitely playing with fire. Uh, two back injury, two back related injuries and two eye um, so we're we're threading the needle. Um, we do have a lot of exposure, but we do need to make sure we're not taking unnecessary risk and we're really thinking about what we're doing before we do it. Um, that seems kind of the underlying message that we've had in the month of April, but it is uh, we're getting back in the swing of things. So taking care of ourselves and looking out for one another and making sure that if there's any questions on safety, they're being addressed. Again, health and safety is here for your guidance and an extra set of hands if you need us please reach out and uh, we're here to help so so right now it's just one day from our last first aid injury um so let's really focus on that today as we uh, get going uh, after the safety meeting i've noticed myself a few startup injuries on new activities and you get a stretch you got to be kind of ready for the you know for the the push when you're when it comes because your body doesn't necessarily react like it had in the past when you get older. That is true. Uh, so I wanted to highlight um, underground damage prevention, uh, something there's been a lot of changes in the system, uh, really just regarding one utility locating, but it's I wanted to highlight as we're really getting going. We've also had an uptick on underground utility close encounters and one in a uh, couple utility incident strikes. Uh, one not our fault, one our fault. Um, so today, just going to highlight the process, kind of talk about 811 quick, the importance of the dig safe ticket, the color cooling system, just to highlight that and re educate, retrain. Uh, and then on re regarding maintaining our marks and then the 18 inch tolerance zone. Uh, this is all going to be about prevention, how to re prevent it. We got a, a future topic about what happens after we hit and documentation. Uh, the safety committee has a, an emphasis of this uh, utility strike prevention as well. So we're going to highlight that uh, down the road. So the 811, it is a law. Uh, the biggest thing is we want to know what's in the ground before we start digging. So the law is 48 hours right now. There's there's legislation out there to potentially move that to 72 in the upcoming years. But for right now, the current system is 48 hours, so we need to make sure that we're calling 48 hours before we want to get out there and dig. We want to get out there and pre-mark, and this is something that I've been hearing from the utility owners themselves. ECI is not the best at pre-marking our job sites, so we really want to make sure we're providing crystal clear pre-marks so they can really give us all the information we need of the known utilities. There's been a lot of times where they've gone out and had to call back in about where actually are you digging? I can't find your flags. I can't find your, your markings. So let's try to make it crystal clear from, from this point moving forward that we're really going out there and pre-marking. Again, that should be white stakes, flags, paint, whatever labeled ECI with some um, measurement, 500 feet you know, with an arrow, 1,000 <clears throat> feet with an arrow. So, so the ticket that they read from our description and what they're seeing out there uh, on site is accurate so then they can really highlight our area with all the calm uh, Vermont gas uh, GMP uh, power lines. Um, 
Make sure we're using our company ID when we're calling these things in 13405. If you have your own, let's get off that and let's use our own because if someone calls looking for a dig take ticket or if something laps and they contact health and safety and we're not using our company ID number, we can't find the record. We lose it. We lose time. We have to recall in a whole ticket. So making sure that everybody has that ID number for engineers construction, it's 13405. Again, make sure that we're staking the whole entire property, making it crystal clear. If you're going to use one single point, give a radius. You know, if it's just a, a sinkhole for a catch basin or something like that. Um, get a new ticket if you need to work outside your pre-marked area. So if we don't do a good job pre-marking and then we have to change our bore plan or the utility that we're trying to fix is, is outside our pre-marks, we need to call a dig safe ticket. We can't just add to an existing ticket. Uh, we've been kind of pushing that envelope a little bit, and and uh, I wanted to make sure that every, everybody has crystal clear guidelines. So that's why pre mark is as large as you need to making sure that we have the information we need to to get our work done. Uh, the importance of the dig safe ticket again is just the awareness. Um, there's a online and it's kind of hard to see, but like with this ticket here that we called in for Williston, it has AT&T, Centerline, Comcast, Consolidated, First Light, Green Mountain Power, VEC. You know, this is going to be a site that's going to be lit up with a lot of paint. So this is great information to provide to the field. So when the when the crew leaders and the, and, and, and the frontline workers get on a job site, they have they know that they should be seeing a lot of utilities if they're not that information needs to get back to kind of health and safety so that we can start making phone calls to figure out who needs to respond and the online uh, version is really nice because it gives phone numbers right here you can make we can make these phone calls we can get service provided to these job sites so we don't want to hold up uh, but it's very important to know now that USIC is only marking first light and that's probably going to change in the next four months or so there's negotiations going on between for first light and center line so center line now is taking pretty much everybody other than vermont gas so uh, please provide feedback uh, with center line because we've worked really hard in the background making this switch getting a, a new utility provider uh, that will go out and really care about our underground infrastructure and also hopefully make our lives safer and easier regarding damage utilities. So it's very important that th this information gets back and forth from the guys doing the work in the office about what what known utilities are in the area so we we know for sure what we have before we got going in. Uh, so just highlighting quickly the universal color coding system. Again, red is electric, gas, <coughs> oil and steam, or for the most part, it's just gas for us here in Vermont, is uh, yellow. All of our telephone, fiber optic, cable TV, so your Comcast, CCI, which is consolidated, Sprint, um, it is orange. Water is marked out by, you'll be CWD, or Williston water, um, that would be blue. Our sewer is green. And then our temporary surveying marks for all of us, we should be utilizing, that's the universal is pink. And then white again is just for our pre-marks. So make sure you have plenty of paint in your job trailers, in your trucks, re keeping those marks refreshed um, and making sure that we have the proper surveying marks and we're not using orange for a survey mark because that could get really confusing. So let's really uh, establish that universal color coding system for putting down any markings on site. I wanted to kind of highlight because I'm working through the AGC with the utility owners to try to make sure that they're providing us a little bit more information. So I know it's kind of small and hard to see, but what we have here is your typical kind of mark out and this is like a duck bank you know which is more than one utility and you kind of see it's four by four with four inches so that's saying that there's four conduits four inches so that the, the common the common ground of under underlying uh, underground utilities says that these locating companies sh 
should or shall provide this for the excavating companies out there. So I'm trying to get that process going. So hopefully we start seeing a little bit more information, not just red paint down, but hopefully they'll identify because that will also help with our underground utilities that are banded. So when we go down and find something, we don't know if it's alive or dead, but if they notify it that it's there's four four inch conduits or if there's a two inch conduit and we find a one inch conduit, that one inch conduit might be abandoned and we're, we're, we need to find that two inch conduit. So that's kind of the vision of this to try to get us more information so we can prevent some of those abandoned utility issues that we have. And then the, the, the identifiers as well, Telcom, Comcast, First Light, you know, they do a pretty good job with telling us all the different com out there, but it'd be great if they also would tell us the size of the utility that we're looking for. So hopefully we'll start seeing that. It's something that we're working hard through the AGC to, to get that happening. And then lastly, it's the law for us to maintain our mark, something that we sometimes lapse on a little bit. So let's making sure that uh, for going to remove any marks, remove the pavement, Let's make sure we have a plan. If it's creating offsets with grade stakes, taking photos, but also calling the surveyors to GPS to come back to establish those marks. Once we remove a mark and we can't maintain it and then we're flying blind, we're putting ourselves at risk for a utility strike. So let's really make sure that we have a plan if we're removing marks. Easiest thing to do, grab a tape, create some offsets, put it in your field book, so we can always go back and uh, refresh those marks pretty much as the as the, as the project um, progresses, especially in some of these long latitudinal projects, waterline projects, a lot of different crossings out there. Um, so let's just make sure that we have a plan and that plan is established. Hey Matt, I got a question. So yep. at, what, at one point are we not required by law to to uh, maintain the marks? What if we're done with our with we do an excavation? There's the marks. We maintain them and we're done and we we're backfilling, but we're still on the project. Are we supposed do we have to keep maintaining those marks beyond the point when no. we're gonna be a problem? So no, the law, what's what does the law say about maintaining the marks? It uh, for excavation op, when we're up when we're digging down to do our work. Soon as we're soon as we're bringing our work back up for to finish grade and doing all of our hardscape. We okay. don't need to maintain them because we're not going back. But if we're okay. going back, if we're doing a bunch of dig downs everywhere, we need to maintain those marks. OK, it would be it's our fault. If if we damage an underground utility, we remove the mark and then we say that it wasn't marked, but yep. so it was marked it. and we didn't maintain yeah. it. You know, so that that's where we get in trouble. Really comes into effect more if we hit something after we've removed the mark, probably. Exactly. Yep. That's what I was saying. Thank you. Hey, Matt, it's Mark Pelequin. Hey, Mark. Uh, I also encourage people to absolutely take photos of their marks <laughs> yeah. as well. We had a job down in Burlington last year or two years ago where Big Safe marked it all out, didn't mark some of the utilities, and then we found one the hard way, and, and huh. they instantly blamed us, but they didn't mark it, and we had photos. So yeah. definitely make sure you document what they do. That's a good idea. Yeah. Well said, Mark. It, it, how the law is kind of written, it's our fault. Any any damage utility is our fault. And we've got to <laughs> prove our innocence. Yeah, <laughs> and we're getting pretty good at it because of the, the current climate. But hopefully, it's getting better, and that's what we've been working hard to get uh, a better utility com company in here and really providing us with good info before we do our dig downs. Mm -hmm. So that la last thing is just really making sure that we're prioritizing our 18 inch tolerance zone. That's again, we're gonna hand dig, vac excavation, whatever it may be to go down, find that known utility. We're not gonna me uh, mechanically with that excavator bucket, breach that 18 inch tolerance zone until we visually see it. You know, if we're, we're doing a pilot hole by it, drilling by it, or with an excavator uh, doing a dig down, <clears throat> we gotta go down with a hand or vac excavation with hand shovels, find that known utility, and then, you know, hopefully stake it, put a great stake in there with the depth so we can go back as we, when we need to cross it later on. So it's very, a great practice is to always pothole ahead of us. Pothole, pothole, pothole. Uh, put in your field book, your depths down the road. And if you're going to be doing a lot of potholing, 
call us. Um, we have underground utilities that will also help provide the depth so we can really hone that in and really streamline that process. So we're not searching, oh, where's this utility? Because we have been seeing also lately that the marks are a little bit off left or right. We don't think they're that deep, but they're actually in our being four and a half, five feet deep on some of these comm lines. So call us and we can really provide you with a lot of information uh, right in real time to help be a time saver and also less back breaking work doing all that hand digging. So it's good exercise. Uh, that yeah. was my first my first job at ECI the first day. Actually, the first week I, they gave me a hand shovel and I worked ahead of the crew locating every single utility crossing that we had by hand um that was my that was my first mission that colby gave me and and we he told me we find everything before we get there and um that was in 1988 so it was true back then and it's still true i think we need to make sure that we use the use the hand shovels and the and the tools close to the utilities and actually find them and yep. and then assess that it makes sense you know he he told me also you're looking for a four inch line if you find a one inch line you didn't find it it was it was simple stuff like that in the old days but it was the same thing yep so we'll that's all i have hand, on we're this. gonna keep buying hand shovels we're gonna keep using them yep so we're not eliminating the hand shovels no it's it's the law <laughs> hey we all set yeah that's all i have any questions please contact me after the meeting and we can we can talk about about this further if there's any other best practice anyone wants to share feel feel free to share okay thanks man i think a lot of it is just having awareness every moment you put the shovel in the ground yep okay yep. i'll take over here okay can you see the screen we got it yep all right this little box out of the way all right announcements hey we have a new eci policy and maybe ben dow are you a good person to explain it sure okay. so in an effort to um to, to get our, our our employees more involved in um helping get good people on board at eci we developed a pilot program um to reward people that uh bring new employees on at eci so uh the purpose of the program i've got it actually right here is to encourage our cur current employees to recruit future employees eci employees should focus on recruiting within our industry people that are not actually past employees we're looking to get some new people in in the door here um so it's not necessarily meant for the returning employees of recruiting them back but i guess we could we got a little bit of leeway there um the recruit should be people who would seem to be a good fit with our culture that's kind of our purpose of this program and um what we want to do is um identify when we hire someone all the hiring managers know about this program try to identify um if someone was actually recruited and 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 if there was a reasonable effort to get someone here um it's pretty easy i've got like four of them right here already and it's it's all about um someone that has been talking to an employee for several several years trying to encourage them to come here is one of them um uh let's see what's another one um someone that convinced another person to come here because he liked it and he thought it was a good culture um and then <clears throat> there was another one where someone was actually related and con and convinced one of their relatives to come here so the way it works nice. is after we hire someone we identify um the fact that someone was referred we have a form an approval form that we can fill out um there's actually a link to it there ken um and there is um a 250 dollar bonus paid to the recruiting employee after the 
new candidate serves for four weeks. So four weeks, $250. And then after six months of full-time employment, employment here at ECI, um, the ECI employee that recruited will receive another 750. So you can actually wow. rec recruit someone here. And if they stay for six months, that means that's a pretty good chance that they're they're the right stuff. That's a thousand dollars. What we've also said is that if you want to recruit, you can do that up to five times per year. Um, we put a cap on it at five thousand dollars. So potentially, if you can get five people on board and they're good employees, and you can get them to be here for six months, that's a five thousand uh, dollar bonus, <laughs> which is that's pretty I think darn that's good. Good. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, Ken, you're not included in the program. Ah. Ah. Um, and and most of our the, what we don't want to do is have a conflict of interest with our like most with the hiring managers and the upper level management is generally generally not included in this. Although we have a little bit of I have a little bit of leeway because um, one of my functions in all this is to determine that there was a, a reasonable recruiting effort and that this is try to, to maintain that this is a sensible thing to do and that it makes sense. Um, we had one employee who learned about this and he said, well, I'm just gonna hang outside the door and have them put put my name on their, their um, application. And one of the things w we do is just try to, to verify that it was a little bit more than that. It doesn't have to be a lot more though. Um, it's, it's all about promoting our culture, um, pr promoting, um, and and the pride that you have in in what we have going here to try to get other people on board that have similar aspirations and goals and would be a good fit. So thousand dollars per 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 each time you can recruit someone who stays here for at least six months. Um, and I'll say if it doesn't work out, we don't hold anything against the recruiting employee. I mean. Sometimes things don't work out for different reasons. What we don't want to do is um, is have anyone um, any any of this reflect negatively on someone who's trying to recruit and improve our culture. So, good. The Ken, you have links so that people yep. can actually click, and they and you can read the policy. It's a one pager, and then uh, everyone can can actually um download the form and fill it out and talk to the to the recruiting there's usually a hiring manager it's usually one of the division leads that ultimately gets people on board here so any of you that um talk to your talk to um talk to your your managers and get them involved in the hiring process and make sure they get this form filled out so you can benefit from it um it's meant to be a positive thing one, one of the employees sure. said to someone the other day, they said, ah, well, I'm going to start recruiting now because we're getting paid for it. <laughs> that was just a little bit to, to give them the to give them the uh, inspiration to do that. So that's cool. Yep, sounds good. Also, I, I put the EEO policy on here again, just as a reminder. Also, I should have put I'd forgotten I was going to do it. Put the uh, link to last year, uh, last week's uh, uh, safety meeting, which we kind of rolled out the the latest, the April 23, which really isn't a much different probably, but we had a, a whole uh, presentation by the uh, the compliance. Well, it's not really a compliance officer, but the EEO officer. And let me see, who was that EEO officer? <laughs> oh, it was Ben Dow. <laughs> we want to reinforce to, that yeah. too. I tried to pin it on McKinney, but he he spoke up real quick. Oh, but yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, and on especially on the state projects, um, they will be the civil rights group of VTrans will be out, and and that's one of the the questions that they're going to ask. That's a real easy one to answer. Who do you have an EEO policy? Yes, and who's your EEO officer, Mr. Dow? Ben Dow is the officer. If you can get those two questions right, they're probably going to leave you alone. If you right. don't, there's all kinds of issues that come up um, where we have to retrain and then we have to stop everybody and have a special meeting. And um, it's all about compliance um, and, it, and it ties to the funding 
of the projects that we do that require that this is being done. So it's just verification. Yes. Okay. So if you didn't see last week's uh, safety meeting of the week, then you can go back to the YouTube channel and Matt can get you that information if you need to as well. Okay, we got new employees. We got an Austin Noel, a Rich Scott, and Jaden Tilton. And one other guy I don't have his picture for this week, but I'll follow up next week. Well, and welcome to all the new people. And certainly if you see them around, make them feel welcome and, uh, and kind of get them to, to be a part of ECI in a very positive way. I have the ECI primary well primary care wellness program link here. So we'll want to get involved in that if you're not already involved. And then for the project of the week, we are highlighting the kickoff to the 2023 paving season, which this week marks the kickoff. And also, I didn't realize it until I was putting this together last night that we are now in our 50th year of paving, believe it or not, AC paving. Uh, which was part of ECI, and now everything's rolled into ECI. But AC paving was started in 1973. Our paving projects this week include the Odell Apartments, first half of Bridge Deck in Huntington for parent construction in Lone Pine Campground, along with some other small projects. And we were also contracted with Pike Industries for coal plain milling in Milton and some milling for our own project uh, for a culvert project on Route 207. The first picture I put out here shows uh, the new uh, low bed truck tractor and it's hooked up to the one of the older pavers. We do have a newer paver which shows up in this photo I'd say. Yep, here it comes. So we get the new paver. It, Jim McNall, are you out there or Daryl, you want to talk about the new paver? Sure, it's a Weiler uh, P385. Nice. Uh heavy duty kind of a mid-size paver that's probably the first dump going into it um up at lone pine campground base paving i think the guy looking down in might be the sales guy josh uh he spent a couple of hours up here uh, on the first day to kind of go over the you all know, the bells and whistles and make sure everything is working fine but uh so far so good you guys like it uh, yeah and, and it's uh, a Different type of paper than our previous ones, right? Correct. Uh, we've yeah. had Maldens for ooh, I don't know, last eight, ten years, twelve years. So this is a cap product, uh, Weiler, um, and there's getting to be more and more of these out there. Um, people are happy with them. It's multi-adjustment screed shapes and profiles, that sort of thing, too. Yep. Yep. Eight to sixteen foot, uh, pretty heavy, heavy uh, screed and. Uh, I forget the horsepower on the tractor. Um, must be up like a hundred or something. I forget. Uh, that's a nice machine. Right, electrically heated uh, yes. streets. Yep. yep. Good. Okay. Good. Well, that's great. And there's a picture from the back end. Yep. Matt. So that guy on the phone, he's the uh, the sales guy. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Josh. The guy without the vest. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> it's always awesome running when you get new equipment, isn't it? It's fun. Yeah. Mm. And we have some compaction on that yes. first piece yep. there. Good. So this is up in Milton, Jim? Yeah, it's got to be up in Milton. Uh, yep. Um, miscellaneous streets. Uh, Trying to think why that building here. I'm not exactly sure. A um, bunch of the streets that's across from the McDonald's. Is that's it? the pull and pull and number place. Yeah, uh, that's main road out there. Yep. yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the opposite side of the road. It's Route Seven. Yep. Okay. Haydenberry. Yep. McDonald's is right there on the left hand side. You can't right, see. Okay, that. Haydenberry. Yep. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, there you go. McDonald's will be on the right hand side, I think. Oh, wow. Heads down in there. That our skid steer too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we were doing. We, we had were, some full the... width. Um, one street was full width and then a whole bunch of these uh, 25 and 50 foot 
butt joints or tapers so they can match into on the overlays uh, not just little trimmer joints they um, spec out these 25 and 50 foot tapers so they're nice smooth transitions so we were doing everything and they trucking must be or uh, they trucked exactly they trucked. We, uh, we did yeah, everything we else did all the mill and trimming um yep. and with one truck and then they subsidized us with additional trucks as I needed see. pretty much yep First, a big part of milling is cleaning it up, right? <laughs> For sure. It really looks like they need it. <laughs> they need the pavement. <laughs> yeah, look at the yeah, it does look like yeah. It. yeah, so you can see like a probably a 50 foot butt joint behind them transition right. out onto Route 7. So you got a nice uh, smooth. Yep. Oh. These were a little fuzzier, so I kept them yeah, on the small side. Yeah, we took them up at Lone Pine. That's the little yep. store and check-in building, yep. uh, doing some fine grading prep, getting ready for that base paving that uh, you just showed earlier, and wrap right. up that job for the most part. Little topsoil seed mulch. The primer. So I, the paving guys, all crew always gets credit for such a nice looking job after it's, <laughs> it's done but it has guy. a lot to do with the guys doing the prep doesn't it that is for sure everybody like wow we and... fix a lot of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little hazy for some reason but we're putting in yeah, that uh, new equipment can and how, how old is that roller the, the back picture that the old uh we call it the <laughs> I forget what nickname for it. The, uh, the duo pack. Or the duo pack. That, that, that had to be here when you got here. I yeah, I think we have a picture of, of Ben on that. I'll dig it up next time. <laughs> Still one of the better roller. It pounds. Yeah. Right. It's funny because uh, you know <laughs> some of these just self destruct, but right. this one's held together. So. Yep. So the asphalt curbing. Yep. Got some curbing going in. And this is the tilt bucket? Yes, yes. They oh, wow. have a whole bunch of, yes, the dump tilt bucket uh, works great for curbing. If right. you had a little bit of shoulder work to do, you could use it for that. Uh, yep. Probably makes a nice wheelbarrow, too. That's exactly no wheeling involved. Right. It'll work great for back, back backing up that curb when somebody decides to go over oh, and do it. Well, Ooh, you know, yeah. Lock it with topsoil or whatever. Yeah, if it's hopefully right. decent and dry and yep. Good. Okay. And then this was uh, up on 207. It... Correct. What town is this actually? It's actually Swanton, Swanton right, Mark? Okay. It's just over the line. Uh, the Swanton line, when you get off exit, what is that? Okay. The second St. Albans. It's only like about a mile up, two miles. You're in Swanton, um, yeah, heading towards Highgate. It's called Swanton Street Culvert, and I was like, "Well, does that mean that it's <laughs> not Swanton?" Or <laughs> so that's coming up this weekend. This job, we're uh, yeah, isn't it right now? Probably or getting probably right now. Close, yep, closing two oh seven, which is kind right. of a major, right? Freeway. Definitely. That's Hopefully, true. everyone already knows. Probably a lot of our our guys. Coming in on 207, we're <laughs> cursing at our job and Could turning be. around and having to go back around 78 or something. They were late <laughs> there right now. Okay, so the photo archives, I have this ah, picture. The 4200. Uh, I, I would wow. assume that's Donnie Jakes in there. Wow. That, that's either DJ or, Don, or Bobby Grant. Could have been Bobby, okay. It's hard to tell. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. We made that into a dump uh, tan uh, tandem dump truck after that, and we yeah. still ran it for many years. I'll tell you a little trivia. Um, Tom Lawyer, I know he's in the background listening, but the dual pack roller that we were talking about. Yeah. yeah. We have to give credit to Tom Lawyer for that because when he worked at Woods, he's the salesman that sold us that awesome roller that we're still <laughs> running. So I don't know what year wow. that was. <laughs> but Tom Lawyer is the took takes credit for selling us that awesome roller. Mm. So I don't know if you knew that, Ken. Tom no, just texted that. Tom texted me. He sold it to us. Did he? So good job. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably in the eighties, <laughs> early nineties. Yeah. 
30. This could have been, this was maybe not even the early 80s. I'm not sure. I can't tell. And certainly that <laughs> truck been around, those that style's been around since the 70s. Yeah. No, it, yep. Well, that's uh, that kind of brings me back to that 50 years ago time anyway, the yep. dual pack and this truck when we started paving in 1973. Oh. Before I was into it, I didn't start. I started, I can't remember. I was in high school or what, whether it was a summer or after I got out of high school, I was on the paving crew anyway. So I was the wheelbarrow operator. (laughs) A lot of our trucks and equipment just had the, we didn't have the logo. When I came here, we had just, it said engineers construction on all of our stuff, kind of just like that. Yep. It was kind of pre-logo. It's kind of cool. It's vintage. That's a vintage picture. Didn't have fancy logo. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know vendors and and systems available back then so yeah all right, well that's what i got we'll turn it back over to to matt have a safe day out there thank you thanks everybody for jumping in being part of today safety folks let's be safe today and if you watch this meeting in a group setting please send me over a text message so i can capture attendance let's have a safe day yeah see ya <laughs>